DNT is making its move to keep the NBA. Plus, we're previewing the Paris Olympics, which are ramping up security measures in a big way, and New Jersey could gain a major sports team. It's Tuesday, July 23rd. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. LeBron James has been officially named the United States flag bearer at the 2024 Olympics opening ceremony. A gold medalist in 2008 and 2012, James is the first U.S. men's basketball player to carry the U.S. flag, which he called an incredible honor. The female flag bearer will be announced today. Bella Hadid is suing Adidas over lack of a public accountability relating to a recent photo shoot that featured her wearing shoes from the 1972 Munich Olympics in which 11 Israeli athletes were taken hostage and killed by Palestinian liberation group Black September. Per TMZ, Hadid, who has been outspoken with her support for Palestinian liberation, is, quote, upset the company would put out a campaign that would associate anyone with the tragedy like the Munich massacre. It looks like Florida State and Clemson are remaining in the ACC for the time being. Pete Thamel reports that both schools are unlikely to submit an intention for conference withdrawal prior to the August 15th deadline. This decision comes off the heels of two lawsuits in which both schools are suing the ACC over its massive exit fee. Withdrawing before 2036 could cost schools anywhere from $120 million to $575 million when factoring in TV revenue. Caitlin Clark is opening the WNBA to new viewers, according to a Nielsen review conducted by the Wall Street Journal. Although every demographic has increased this season, the study alleges that viewership increases have been most substantial in three main demographics, young, white, and male. This increase in viewership comes at the intersection of burgeoning league interest and new, more robust TV offerings for the casual fan. TNT has elected to match an offer for NBA media rights. Joining me now to discuss is front office sports newsletter writer, Eric Fisher. Welcome, Eric. Hello. So let's start real basic here. What has TNT elected to do in these rights negotiations? So they had matching rights as part of the current deal, and uh, they were uh, on the uh, outside looking in in the next term, and they elected to use those matching rights, and they have uh, submitted a bid to match up with Amazon's uh, package that is known as the C package, which includes uh, a series of rights, including the in-season tournament, which is now called the NBA Cup, uh, and the conference finals every other year, some regular season inventory, WNB right, WNBA rights, some other assets worth about a billion eight per year, and uh, TNT Sports and their parent company, Warner Brothers Discovery, is elected to match that. Got it. And if they're successful, you know, survive any court challenges here, do we know what, what this means? Like, does, it, does Amazon get to have NBA media rights if, if TNT does also? Like, we're, we're in a big, murky situation. As we're taping this, we have not yet heard back from the league in terms of how they're receiving this matched offer, whether or not they actually constitute it as a match. And that's one of the big questions out there is what exactly defines a match beyond just the raw inventory and the raw dollars to what extent are there other components such as uh platform distribution how the money is sequenced a variety of other factors that may sort of define whether or not there is a match in a true sense of how the the league is defining that and that's the big question out there and so um the ball's sort of back in the league's court now, again, as we're taping this, um, and we'll see what, what shakes out. There's a variety of scenarios where this could go, that Amazon could be on the outside looking in and, and TNT gets this package. There could be some other settlement. There could be a legal challenge. Um, the, the settlement itself could take a variety of forms, whether that's just monetary or some some other relationship that maintains. There's a lot of different ways that this could still go. There's this maybe not super sophisticated part of my brain that says Amazon's going to find a way in here because there's there's too much money. I imagine there's a lot of desire on the NBA side to establish that relationship. Um, obviously, you know, the the contracts, the contract, the TNT has these matching rights. But if, whether it's a fourth package or some challenge to TNT, um, I, that's that's my sense. I'm wondering if you, you've gotten you know any indication one way or another there. Too soon to tell, but that 
it sort of gets back to the question that's been sort of hanging out there that why hasn't there been more talk about a fourth package? And there's a variety of reasons for that because five, six months ago, maybe that was a big source of discussion as to uh, the potential of a fourth package happening to keep TNT in the game here. And in recent months, that notion had faded out. And then we got to the point where these were three other deals uh, with Disney, NBC Sports, and Amazon were the ones actually approved by the NBA Board of Governors. There's a variety of reasons sort of hanging out there and theories that, you know, is Warner Brothers Discovery that's got a ton of debt and a sagging stock and so forth. Are they up to the financial heft of staying in business with the league? Mixed opinions on that. Um, what's going to become of NBA.com and NBA TV? Some notions that maybe that joint venture between uh, TNT and the league, maybe that gets pulled internally. Uh, maybe there's some other structure for those assets. Um, Maybe the other partners were balking at the notion of a fourth partner coming in. There's a lot of different scenarios sort of hanging out there. But again, that that notion of a fourth package still seems to be the potential of a middle ground that allows everybody to save face here. Right. And, and there are there are games to go around. I mean, maybe the NBA has a certain number of games that they're willing to put on national TV or contractually can put on national TV. But it's not like they're lacking for for total number of games. Yes and no. Um, to really make all the partners whole to cover the math that way, you probably have to pull some inventory that would have otherwise gone to local rights holders, which creates its own complication. Not unresolvable, but you know, it just makes the math a little bit more complicated. Do we know how Disney and NBC could be affected by by this latest news? And are, are they kind of out of the fray here or Right now, they're probably sitting pretty because those packages were more expensive and the NBC package in particular, uh, TNT and, and Warner Brothers Discovery thought that was a bit of an overpay from their perspective, uh, given the, the costs involved and what was included. Um, but we could potentially hear a little bit more come Tuesday morning. Comcast, the NBC sports parent, is going to be reporting its next quarterly earnings. And beyond the Olympics, of course, this NBA subject is almost certain to come up uh, in the analyst call. And we may learn a little bit more. But to more bluntly answer your question, right now it appears that because those A and B packages held by Disney and, and NBC, respectively, are not the target of uh of Warner Brothers Discovery right now, they're continuing on. Just when we thought maybe this story was coming to a conclusion, it is very much not. Eric Fisher, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Sure, always a pleasure. In 1776, George Washington crossed the Delaware River. Now the 76ers might make the same move. The NBA team has been frustrated in their efforts to build an arena in downtown Philadelphia and are exploring the option of traversing the river to Camden, New Jersey, according to ROINJ. The move makes a fair amount of sense on paper. The Sixers owners, David Blitzer and Josh Harris, already have relationships in New Jersey because they also own the Devils. While they are apparently ready to finance a new arena without public support, they could potentially get some anyway, as they could be eligible for a state program that would give them $400 million in tax relief. Philadelphia is the sixth largest city in the U.S. by population, so it would be a little strange to move a team out of there, but Camden is quite close to Philadelphia, so close, in fact, that it's quite possible the team could move while keeping Philadelphia in their name, which would give New Jersey the strange honor of hosting three major teams, the 76ers, Giants, and Jets, that identify with another state. Things got fishy in Norway this weekend, where fans effectively canceled a soccer game by throwing fish cakes onto the field. Their anger was directed at the VAR, or Video Assistant Referee System, whose introduction to the league has been met with criticism for ruining the matches, with its time-consuming review process. Initially, fans tried to prevent the match from starting by throwing the fried fillets. Both teams were sent back to their respective locker rooms before the officials attempted to restart the match a few minutes later. Fans doubled down with more cakes, tennis balls, and even smoke bombs being thrown onto the field. After 30 minutes of this, the refs decided to call the match at 0-0 and send both teams home. This league, Norway's elite Syrian, has seen a handful of similar demonstrations against VAR over the past few months. The war against this technology rages on, but it remains to be seen what fans' next edible projectile will be. Just ahead of the Olympics opening ceremony on Friday, there are natural concerns about safety. For the first time ever, the kickoff event will not be held indoors at a stadium, rather it will be outside along the Seine River. This unique venue presents unique security challenges and public questions over the safety of the 10,000-plus athletes and millions of spectators who will be in attendance. 
Reports of a rapidly expanding security presence have emerged from Paris, mentioning a robust police force, fighter jet oversight, and even AI monitoring systems to prevent cyber attacks. However, the introduction of these forces presents a new challenge, especially for locals. The Associated Press reports that French digital rights advocacy groups are growing increasingly concerned about these intense security measures sticking around after the games conclude, which they feel would be an intrusion on freedom and privacy. Last year, the head of the Paris Olympics said the city would be, quote, the safest place in the world when the games begin. Based on the early reports out of Paris, it seems like they're doing everything they can to make good on that promise. Up next, the first contest of the Paris Olympics are tomorrow, and the opening ceremony is on Friday. The previous Summer Olympics were delayed due to COVID and happened in front of empty crowds, so this will be the first Summer Olympics that feel normal in a basic sense since the Rio de Janeiro Games in 2016. I spoke to former IOC executive Anish Madani on how the games and the media around them have evolved in that time, and that conversation is next. I'm joined now by Anish Madani, former executive at the International Olympic Committee and Twitter. Welcome, Anish. Hey, Owen. Thank you for having me. How are you doing? Yeah, the Olympics are starting this week. Um, you know, because it's an event, you know, the summer games obviously only, only happen every four years. The the Olympics themselves happen every two years. So each of those is kind of a unique moment in in the media world, in the sports world. How do you think these Olympics, especially when it comes to the fan experience, are the Paris games going to be different from years past? What's really interesting for me is that Paris seems to be a pivotal moment uh, in the in the history of the Olympic moment, if you will, because this decade, actually, we've had Olympic hosts that have hosted the Olympics before. So you go from Tokyo to Beijing to Paris and all the way from Milan to Los Angeles, right? So you look at those uh, those five cities um, and you can see that it's sort of growing and there's a pattern through the decade and nobody could foresee the pandemic uh, before Tokyo happened. And, and I think that makes Paris even more, more special uh, in the context of all the athletes that get the opportunity to, to take that, you know, that work of a lifetime um, and sort of, bring it there and we've got some iconic menus i think the fan experience uh it's going to be pretty incredible usual summertime in paris right uh people getting together after such a long time especially for a summer games eight years back in rio so i'm excited and does this olympics feel higher stakes um you know for the ioc than i mean i feel like every olympics because it's a rare event it has has a lot of stakes but we're coming off of in the previous summer games were postponed for COVID. When they finally happened, there was a lot of mixed feelings on whether they even should be happening. Um, and then you know, the the Beijing games, you know, happened only a few months later. And you know that it's it, we're still in that COVID phase. Uh, it, it feels like this is a comeback moment, but that it still has to deliver. The games haven't happened yet. Did, is there that vibe you think around these games? The sense I get, honestly, is that this is a moment of opportunity. Right? If you see the buildup, especially over the last 12 months, then there's a lot going on in the world. Um, but with Paris specifically, there's so many things coming together with new storylines around, you know, who are going to be the athletes of the summer, right? Who's going to be the new sprint king or the new sprint queen, for instance, uh, thinking about, you know, athletes that, you know, came back after Tokyo to to be there again in Paris, perhaps for a last hurrah. So in a lot of ways, to me, it feels like a moment where there's an opportunity, um, both for the athletes to shine, but equally for the organizers and frankly, even the partners to sort of um, come out and, and, and show a few things that they that they may have been waiting to do for, for a while. How do you think, you know, so like Peacock is, you know, the and, and Comcast are the big media partners uh, in, the, on, in the U.S. for the Olympics. How do you see them approaching these games? To be honest, it feels like this is a moment of sort of expansion of choice, if you will, for fans, right? Um, I think the start of the decade felt a bit of that moment where streaming and the options for people to stream all of the Olympics is beginning to come together. I think now in a lot of parts of the world, like, you know, in my mind, this is one of the first Olympics, uh, especially the Summer Olympics, where anyone anywhere could have the opportunity to watch the games, you know, the top of their screen, right? Uh, and, and, and all of it. Uh, and I think the fact that you have so much choice at the Olympics in terms of sports to watch, athletes to follow, all coming together on singular platforms, and that choice, frankly, not only being expanded, but also easier to understand for people as to how to follow, that's kind of going to be the key, because a lot of things are going for it, right? The time zones are better. 
uh, especially in the US uh, for these games. Um, there's, yeah, there's a lot of things to think about there, but uh, to me, it feels to, it feels like there's that opportunity really to be able to uh, put it all together in one place and expand the choice that fans have. Yeah. And I think it's an event or a series of events that pretty well positioned for sort of the, the modern kind of highlight focused way of consuming sports. Cause there's, you know, maybe five ish sports that I think come in with a lot of attention on them, you know, soccer, basketball, gymnastics, swimming, maybe a couple others. And, and then there's, you know, the, the, the other, the, this whole like world of sports, some of which people haven't even heard of or didn't realize were Olympic sports or are newly Olympic sports like break dancing um, that could produce some amazing content and new stars, but we kind of have to see them first to know, do we care? Is it interesting? Is it fun? Um, and, uh, so yeah, it'll just be interesting to see, you know, what, what people glom onto and if there are breakout stars, um, you know, in climbing or, or other sports like that. Yeah. To me, honestly, the appeal of the Olympics is the fact that it's scarce and timeless and universal because you could get behind athletes from your own country, or you could just get behind a great story. And I think all it takes is one story to pop out, especially in the early days of the games, uh, for the momentum to build, for the interest to sort of uh, go along. And, you know, you have, I think, especially at these games, so many major superstars as well, uh, who really want something out of these games, right? An example is Novak Djokovic uh, in tennis, right? He's won literally everything there is to win in the sport. Uh, and he really, really wants that Olympic singles gold medal, for instance, right? He's publicly shared that. Um, so if you're a fan of tennis, you're just curious about that story to see how that might play out, for instance. Um, and then, you know, uh, there's a lot more that, uh, that you can look forward to. Yeah. And we're another reason we're in an interesting media moment with all this is uh, we're also in the midst of this rise of sports docuseries and documentaries. And it, that, you know, you'd think would dovetail perfectly with the Olympics where, uh, yeah, if you can get invested in a character, um, it, it really can drive your interest in the games as a whole. I mean, I think the big example right now is the Simone Biles doc that's out now. Um, mm -hmm. But I think, you know, there's there's going to be more um, and there's going to be ones that kind of follow the games where, you know, that the, the, the breakout, you know, rugby star or whoever um, uh, that captures people's imaginations, the track stars um, that, you know, new opportunities for, for people to kind of glom on to, um, to these, these characters who they as of right now have not heard of. There's another one out on, on Netflix sprint, right. Following the, the fastest men and women on earth. Um, and I can see that sort of beginning to build, right, for sports that um, have an approach um, that, you know, is sort of long term in that view, right? You just can't change um, some of these patterns of interest overnight. But through the course of time, you may end up either with a really charismatic athlete like you had for Usain Bolt, for instance, for almost a decade. Um, at the Olympics uh, and really taking sort of the conversation around athletics and sprinting to another level. Um, you know, back from India, for instance, uh, I was in Tokyo when uh, Neera Chopra won a gold, the only gold for India uh, at Tokyo 2020. And again, it takes one athlete to sort of change the conversation around the sport, sometimes which may or may not be actively followed uh, through you know, periods of time, but uh, it can suddenly move the dial altogether. Is there anything that you're, 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 that are going to kind of be the big variable for you in terms of how mm -hmm. these Olympics play out and, you know, whether it's a success or not, or just kind of ha how you're gauging the, the games over the next couple of weeks. So one thing that's been constantly sticking out to me is, are these games going to be the creator Olympics? And what I mean by that, it's a conversation around both athletes and digital creators, right? Um, who were not there together uh, in Tokyo, right? And fans as well. Um, and I was reading this I think, Ericsson Mobility Report, which talked about how uh, there are maybe about half a billion people that had 5G access in 2021. And now that's like more than 2 billion people, right? Um, and you can start seeing how as people get this access, as athletes have built now almost, I'd say, a decade, decade and a half worth of their following on social media as well, right? 
this is where the stories really start coming to life in a way like maybe it never has. Because, you know, if you think if you go back in history, Instagram stories wasn't around when the Olympics in Rio started. TikTok wasn't launched uh, when the Rio Olympics happened. Um, and if you just think about those two platforms as an example, right, in the context of how many people use them today uh, and the stories that are shared and sort of the interest that uh, you, can, you can sort of begin to develop with that, um, that's what I'm personally going to keep an eye out on to see how the athletes and the creators sort of bring the story uh, of these Olympics to life. And, and having Paris as a backdrop to that is, is almost perfect for that. You could do worse. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Fascinating stuff. Anish Madani, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thank you so much, Owen. Appreciate it. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, tell a friend, throw us a like on YouTube or a rating wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.